Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we are going to do the Battle of Midway. This is part one, so told from the Japanese perspective. Uh, this is a three-part series. I'm actually going to cut it up more than that, mostly because, well, because the videos are like an hour long. So instead of doing them in one hour and 15 minute segments or so, I'm going to cut them up and probably do... 20 minutes of the actual video today, the the video itself will probably be about 30, 35 minutes long, and then I'll do the second half of it tomorrow, and that's how we'll do the three parts, as long as they're super long. If there's a part that's not as long, then I'll do it all in one sitting, um, but an hour just seems like too, too long. I don't feel like I have anybody's attention for that long. So, the Battle of Midway, 1942, part one, let's get into it. It's been six months since the attack on Pearl Harbor, and so far, the war has been triumphant for the Empire of Japan. They had achieved a string of victories across the Pacific and had captured many research-rich territories. However, Japan still found herself in a difficult position. Despite all of their successes, their biggest opponent, the United States, had yet to show any signs of surrendering. This was worrisome. Japan needed to end the war quickly before the U.S., with its mighty industrial strength, ultimately defeated them. So what Japan needed was to win a decisive battle, one that would demoralize the Americans and finally bring them to the negotiating table. It was considered that America's center of gravity was its Pacific fleet, primarily its carriers. Destroy this, and you destroy their will to continue the war. Therefore, the only chance Japan had of winning this war was if the American carrier fleet was destroyed. But the so, a couple of things. One, this is absolutely the Japanese game plan, right? They're trying to, if not outright, get the U.S. to surrender, which would be great. But some people within the Japanese hierarchy, are they don't expect that. But what they want is a big enough window, a, a buffer for long enough that... Essentially, it makes it impractical for the U.S. to jump into the Pacific at that point, right? So they feel like if they can get a window and take the things they want to take in the Pacific, um, it will maybe not knock the U.S. out of the war. Like maybe the U.S. won't outright surrender, but it, it'll make it to where the U.S. doesn't want to get heavily involved in the Pacific, which ultimately is where the Japanese goals are, right? Um, and so that's number one. Two, I'm not sure if that's going to work, right? I think, yes, absolutely the Pacific Fleet is kind of the, the beating heart of the U.S. here, especially for the Pacific, because they don't really have anything else to, to use in the Pacific, right? It's just the Pacific Fleet. Um, however, when the U.S. needs ships, and specifically carriers, later in the war, they are going to start cranking them out in a way that literally makes the, the British, like, beside themselves. They can't believe that the U.S. is basically mass-producing aircraft carriers. So I don't know if this strategy was doomed to failure because eventually the U.S., even with the win at Midway, adapts to be able to crank out a ton of ships, right? A ton of ships. Cargo ships or what they use as cargo ships, carriers. Um, it's, it's really kind of incredible, the manufacturing that happens when push comes to shove for the U.S. But that is the overall game plan for Japan. And looking at it from the Japanese perspective... I don't know what other option you have. There's no way to take what you want to take in the Pacific with, without kind of poking at the United States. So what do you do? Just wait for the U.S. to attack you? Or do you try to knock them out or, or at least, you know, extract enough of a toll that it makes them second guess being involved out there at all? I think they kind of did what they had to do if they were going to go the expansion route. The question was how to provoke the carriers from leaving its safe base at Pearl Harbor. 
The answer, attack an objective the Americans wouldn't relinquish without a fight. And after much debate, it was decided that Midway would be that objective. If the Japanese attacked and invaded Midway, the Americans would certainly respond in force and this would finally give the Imperial Japanese Navy a chance to annihilate the American carrier fleet once and for all. And thus, Operation MI was created with the objective of capturing Midway and destroying the Pacific Fleet. It is just like everything the Japanese do, ridiculously complex, there's a ton of moving parts, it's kind of ridiculous. In fact, a lot of these battles and, and fights are ridiculous. The Japanese are super, super in-depth and detailed about their plans and strategy, and I feel like all of them are ridiculously complicated. The Japanese premised their plan on achieving surprise, and therefore would have to make the 3,000 mile voyage on radio silence. Also, they were to disperse their forces in order to avoid detection and mask their intentions. In conjunction, there was another operation to the north to take over the Aleutian Islands, which was codenamed Operation AL. And so on the early hours of June 4th, all the forces were in position to attack a small, tiny atoll in the central Pacific. The stage was set for one of the most epic engagements in naval history. This is the Battle of Midway. The battle will be told from the Japanese perspective. The fog of war will be included during this video. That means you, the audience member, will only know the positions of the Americans the moment the Japanese commander knew of it. This is to put the audience member in the commander's seat to see how they would have reacted themselves given the unique circumstances and complex scenarios that plagued the Japanese on the morning of June 4th. That's a really cool way to do this. Like, really, that's a cool way to do this. So to start off, let's see who the commander was and what his forces were. Spearheading the MI formations were four top-of-the-line fleet carriers of the 1st Mobile Striking Force, also known as the Kido Butai. This was the most destructive offensive weapon the Japanese Navy had, and would be the main protagonist of the upcoming fight. Its commander is Vice Admiral Nagumo Chuichi. He was 55 and had assumed command of the 1st Air Fleet in April of 1941. He didn't get this post because he had naval aviation experience. In fact, he has specialized in torpedoes. He got the job simply based on seniority. It was said his command style lacked decisiveness and that he was too reliant on his staff. Nevertheless, in June of 1942, he was the most experienced carrier commander in the world. Nagumo had four carriers with him this day. His flagship was the Akagi. The Akagi was the oldest and longest of all the flat tops. She had a large aircraft capacity and since she had been converted from a battle cruiser hull, possessed a high speed. The Kaga was a battleship conversion so this made her the least maneuverable and the slowest of the four. But she did embark the most aircraft. While typical squadron strength was 18, she herself carried 27 carrier attack planes. These two carriers were the stolid warhorses of the Kido Butai. They packed a mean punch and were not to be messed around with. Next came the two dashing cavaliers of Carrier Division 2. They were the smaller but more nimble Soryu class. They were designed from the kill up had a good air group size and a very high speed due to their light hulls and construction. However, the downside was that they were lightly armored. The Soryu came first, being commissioned in 1937. She was well liked in the navy. Her near sister ship, the Hiru, was almost identical, but had a larger bridge and was slightly better armored. Ryo Admiral Yamaguchi was the commander of Carrier Division 2 and he made the Hiru his flagship. He was another high-ranking member of the fleet and was known to be an aggressive, hot-tempered commander compared to Nagumo. From the four carriers, Nagumo had a combined strength of 248 aircraft. Damn. 260 total aircraft if one includes the scout planes from his escorting cruisers. What was equally important in the aircraft themselves was the quality of Nagumo's air crews. It wasn't a stretch to say that at this point in the war, the best naval pilots in the world were on board these four ships. Nagumo's mission was not going to be a walk in the park. He essentially had a dual mission. 1. Take out Midway. He needed to neutralize the base and its aircraft before the invasion convoy arrived two days later. 
and task number two was to keep a lookout for enemy carriers that might appear in the defense of the islands. Now this was unlikely, as the Americans were not expected to react so quickly to the invasion. But as a safe measure, he was to keep half of his strike force armed with anti-shipping weapons in the event the Americans did show up early. It has to be mentioned here that there were some ominous signs for the Japanese. As mentioned, the Japanese were counting on surprise for this bold operation to succeed. However, on the eve of battle, there were signs that this may not be going their way. Intelligence had revealed suspicious enemy activities around Midway, meaning the Americans were more alert than they should have been. And second, it must be emphasized that the Japanese, up to this point, have failed to confirm the location of the carriers. The Japanese believed they would have to face against two, possibly three carriers to their four, so it was imperative that they get a confirmation of their whereabouts. It was believed that they would still be in Pearl Harbor during the first days of the operation, and there were two attempts to verify this. The first was a reconnaissance mission to reconnoiter Pearl Harbor. However, this mission had been cancelled. But there was still a fallback plan. A picket line of submarines ahead of Nagumo's force. And so far, none of them had reported anything at all. This indicated to Nagumo that the American carriers were most likely still in port. So as far as Nagumo was concerned, everything was going as planned. Dawn, June 4th. Compared to the scattered cloud cover to the northeast, the Kido Butai found itself under low but light cumulus clouds. The carriers continued to steam into the wind, which was coming from the southeast, to prepare for the air raid. At 0430, a strike of 108 aircraft was launched against Midway. All of these planes were launched in just 10 minutes, a testament to the skill and training of the Japanese pilots. Leading the strike was Lieutenant Tomonaga Joishi. He was a veteran of the air war over China, but this would be his first combat sortie against the Americans. Nagu yeah, and that's where a lot of these pil <laughs> pilots have their experience from, is from China. So... A lot of the American pilots are kind of green, right? Don't have a ton of experience. You obviously have pilots that flew at Coral Sea, but all in all, the U.S. hasn't been fighting a major conflict, right? Whereas Japan has been fighting with, with China now f forever. Um, and so there's, there's a difference there, but... This is a different type of warfare. This the Japanese and US fighting is different than what Japanese troops and and China was was doing, right? So it's it's a little bit of a switch up. However, these certainly and I've heard it argued a million different ways, but these certainly could be argued to be the absolute best pilots um in that that fought in the Pacific like start to finish that fought in the Pacific. Um, so it's kind of a, it's kind of a double edged sword because on one hand, those are obviously the pilots you want in an operation like this, right? Like you would not rather have anybody else. However, if something goes wrong, these are all your good pilots. And so kind of a double edged sword. That's why element of surprise going in with radio silence complex plan right all that stuff is being done because you know you want the good outcome obviously and a bad outcome here could be really devastating going forward gumo had to keep the other half of his planes in reserve in case american carriers appeared the pilots in this group were the a team the best the kido butai had to offer akagi's torpedo squadron was said to be the best in the navy while Carrier Division 2 had the reputation of having the best dive bombers. Any report of an American carrier and these pilots would make easy work of them. At the same time of the launch of the Midway Strike Group, reconnaissance planes were sent out from the escorting cruisers. The search consisted of seven lines, six of which stretched out to 300 miles. Clearly, with only seven planes to cover more than 176,000 square miles, the search effort can be considered half-hearted, perhaps even negligent. 
but in Nagumo's defense, it must be reminded that this was a precautionary air search. Simply put. They don't expect the, the American carriers to be anywhere near here, right? The, it's a trap. The whole thing is a trap for the U.S. Like, the Japanese are setting a trap here by going after Midway. Obviously, if you're setting a trap, you aren't expecting the other side to know that it's coming. And so, yeah, I mean, a lot of the decisions here made by Japan are because they they expect that the U.S. doesn't know this trap is coming. That's, you know, that's just what it is. Put, Nagumo and his staff were convinced that no enemy carriers would appear this early into the battle. Although, I would say criticism is justified. I mean, given the fact that Intel reported suspicious activities around Midway, and given the bad weather in the area, Nagumo should have doubled his search efforts as a safety measure. It's what a prudent commander would have done. Anyway, the launch of the search planes went well, except that the launching of float plane number 4 from the cruiser Tone was delayed for 30 minutes. As the military proverb goes, no plan survives contact with the enemy, and today would be no exception. The operation officially began to unravel at 0532. An American Catalina PBY was spotted surveying the Kido Butai. Damn, Nagumo had been spotted, meaning surprise had been lost. This meant that the Americans would be able to get their land based aircraft airborne before his strike arrived. As predicted, the Americans had been able to launch all of its planes before the strike arrived. The bombers went to attack the Japanese carriers. Only the fighters stayed behind to defend the islands. These were 18 obsolete buffaloes and 6 wildcats. They intercepted the Japanese at 0620, 30 miles from the base. They never stood a chance with the more agile Zeros. In the ensuing battle, 13 buffaloes and 2 wildcats were lost. The carrier strike aircraft pushed through and began their bomb runs. Carrier Division 2 level bombers struck first at 0634. The dive bombers would come next at 0640. On Easter Island, the power plant, command posts, gasoline lines, and mess hall were destroyed. But damage to the runways was minor. On Sand Island, the oil tanks were set ablaze and the water lines were hit. A seaplane hangar and various base facilities were also destroyed. For their effort, American fighters and anti-aircraft fire destroyed 11 Japanese planes. Another 14 would be rendered unserviceable when they landed back on their carriers. That's a 23% loss. The damage to Midway support facilities had been heavy, but the base wasn't out of the fight. The air group commander, Lt. Tomonaga, looked back at the condition of Midway and with great dissatisfaction, had to report back to Nagumo that a second strike was needed to neutralize the base. Yeah, so if you're the Japanese right now, think about what has gone opposite your direction so far, right? You have the plan, you have this sneak attack, you're going to lay the trap. You get there, everything's going well, um, you obviously, you send up your kind of half how half-hearted scouting parties and, and everything like that. Then you get spotted by a plane. So what happens? Obviously, Midway gets their planes off the ground, so the planes aren't sitting there on the ground when the Japanese wave comes, right? Which wouldn't have been the case anyway, but the Japanese don't know that, okay? So the, the planes aren't sitting there with the Japanese waiting to come in and take, you know, take them out. Um, so they get off the ground, and so... Now, instead of you destroying these planes, they're on their way to you, right? Now, obviously, the obsolete fighters got, got crushed, and the Zeros were, were great planes um, for the time period. However, now you have this wave of, of bombers heading your direction, so you've been sighted. They know where you are. They know that you're there. But then not only that, your wave of bombers 
doesn't do what it needs to do to take Midway out of the fight. And so then you ha- you go back and are like, okay, well, now we need this second wave. All the while, there are still bombers headed your way, right? So your bombers aren't back yet. There are other bombers coming from the mainland Midway. And that's just as of right now what has gone wrong for them. What follows next is a series of complicated events and situations happening to both the Kiro Butai and on board Nagumo's headquarters. So I'll tackle them separately, starting with the initial airstrikes against the Kiro Butai. At 0710, six TBF Avengers and four Army B-26s were spotted approaching the Japanese carriers. This would be the first of four separate attacks from Midway base aircraft that would harass them throughout the early morning. Over 30 fighters were sent to destroy the 10 American warplanes. The Avengers selected the Hiru. Zero swarmed over them and one by one the torpedo bombers were shot down. Only two were able to launch at the Hiru but from extreme range and they missed. The four B-26s which had been modified to carry torpedoes went for the Akagi. Only two were able to launch but they both missed. The real danger was posed by the last B-26. The damaged bomber made no attempt to pull out of its attack. Instead, it headed directly for Akagi's bridge. Nagumo and his staff saw this and were shocked. The Americans were not supposed to show this kind of bravery. The bomber pressed on and at last minute, narrowly missed the bridge and crashed into the sea. His suicide attack had failed, but surely it had given Nagumo and his staff one hell of a scare. Despite the bravery and determination, the attack had failed to achieve a single hit. Five Avengers and two Marauders had been shot down. The Japanese lost two zeros. Half an hour later, at 0753, a new force was spotted approaching the mobile force. 16 Marine Corps Dauntless Dive Bombers. Nine zeros set out to destroy them. The dive bombers pressed on and went for the Hiru. Instead of going for a steep dive, ensuring accuracy, these planes conducted a glide bombing attack. They were clearly inexperienced pilots if this was their way of attacking. Yeah, and again, this is what I was talking about earlier with regards to the level of pilots you have on the Japanese side versus the level of pilots you have on the American side. There's just a big difference, right? The Americans have not been fighting in a prolonged war and the Japanese have so that's the reality of the situation. They managed to bracket the Hiro with some near misses but ultimately no hits were scored. They lost half of their squadron leaving only eight survivors to return to Midway. The Japanese lost only one zero. And shortly after that attack 15 army B-17s attacked from 20,000 feet. At this altitude, the B-17s were immune to the anti-aircraft fire below them. However, this also greatly diminished their accuracy. They went. Yeah, accuracy at this height at this time sucks, right? I mean, it is brutally bad. So, but still, even with it being the accuracy being bad, imagine that you're on one of these aircraft carriers, <coughs> and you're looking up watching these bombs and and like maneuvering trying to essentially keep them from hitting you like what a wild scene that would be and after the soru hiru and akagi but the carriers below them had more than enough time to conduct evasive maneuvers and avoid the bombs there were no losses on either sides and no hits were scored only near misses on the soru and hiru caused any alarm A remarkable set of photographs were taken at this moment. Here's the Hiru dodging a couple of very near misses. Note the three fighters of combat air patrol on her flight deck. Here we got the Akagi, Nagumo's flagship, while under attack. Easily noticeable is the red rising sun painted on the deck. And the third picture shows the Soru. She's conducting a tight turn to starboard to avoid being hit. Carrier doctrine and flight deck operations need to be commented on here. 
was obviously the defense of the carriers. This came in three forms, anti-aircraft fire, combat air patrol, and evasive maneuvers. Japanese anti-aircraft fire capabilities were very weak so could not be counted on. So this let fighter cover and evasive maneuvers as the main forms of defense for Nagumo's force. There was a downside though. One, due to the evasive maneuvers that require wild and violent turns, it was obviously dangerous to spot or launch a squadron of aircraft while being bombed. So let's say you wanted to launch an airstrike, but then you found yourself under attack. It would actually be better to wait until the attack was over to then fly off your strike. And second point, as these pictures show, Japanese flight decks had to be kept clear anyways during air attacks for the replenishment of their own fighters. And this was rather frequent since the Zero had about 7 seconds of cannon ammunition. Fighters were given priority because they did after all provide the most effective measure of defense. Hence, the only activity you would see during attacks was the recovery, replenishment, and relaunching of these small packets of fighters. Three at a time, sometimes six at a time. In other words, and the point I'm trying to drive in here was that, as a general rule, you couldn't launch a strike while under attack. So let's just say hypothetically that at this moment Nagumo wanted to send a strike. It was prudent to just wait until the attack was over, maybe 15-20 minutes, and then launch his aircraft. So maybe these attacks aren't being accurate or deadly, but they are hindering flight operations. Keep this in mind as you will see the fateful consequences of it. Midway's final attack came at 0827. 11 old Marine Corps Vindicator dive bombers arrived from the southeast. These were obsolete bombers and they wisely did Yeah, geez, half of these planes are absolute garbage by this point. I mean, really cool planes, don't get me wrong, but not cut out for this time period or what they're being asked to do. Decided not to go for the formidably defended carriers. Instead, they selected the battleship Haruna as their target. There were 11 fighters on combat air patrol to oppose them. The Americans persisted and made their dives on the Haruna, but once again, none of them scored a hit. Two Vindicators were lost during the attack. And, in the midst of all of this, a submarine had been spotted, and at 0825 it fired a torpedo at the battleship Kirishima. This is going to be a big ass deal. This is seriously, this is going to be a huge deal that this submarine causes some problems, right? Now it's not gonna like, it's not gonna cause problems like it's gonna sink a carrier or something, but in the long run, it being there actually is going to play a big role. The battleship dodged it by turning to port, and the destroyer Rashi was detached and sent in pursuit to chase down the submarine. As you can see, this had all been a narrow escape for the Japanese. These series of close calls surely had everyone on the edge of their seats. Although the Japanese were impressed by the determination of the attacks, they were not impressed by the skills of these pilots. Despite 52 planes being dedicated to the attack, not a single hit was achieved on the Japanese. The biggest success these attacks had was that it had kept the Japanese off balance from 0700 to 0830, which as we will see was a critical time for Nagumo. Let's see, where are we at? Alright, let's keep going. During the early morning attacks on the Kido Butai, a more serious situation was developing in the high command with Nagumo and his staff. Shortly after 0700 hours, Nagumo received Tomonaga's report that a second strike was needed. The news was unpleasant, but had actually been expected. How could a force of 72 bombers, half of which were armed with medium-sized bombs, be expected to neutralize a fortified base? He could allow Tomonaga's flight to return, refuel and rearm, and then send them back. But of course this would take hours to complete, allowing the Americans to lick their wounds and reform their defense. This would contribute further casualties. Or alternatively, he could strike the Americans while they were still down. He could use his reserve aircraft who at the moment stood idly by doing nothing. But these were exclusively off the table because Yamamoto had ordered them to be reserved in case of an enemy carrier task force appearing. But surely, Yamamoto- Yeah, remember though, 
there isn't a carrier nearby, right? Like that's the whole thing is that the carriers are at Pearl. They're, this is a trap. They're not going to be anywhere near here. The, from the Japanese perspective, there is like a 0% chance that carriers are anywhere near here. So what do you do? Moto wasn't expecting Nagumo to fight an entire battle with only half his strength. I mean, come on, this was tantamount to making Nagumo fight this entire battle with one arm tied behind his back. And this right here had been the fault in the whole midway plan. There simply weren't enough planes. There weren't enough planes to do the dual mission, to both attack midway and to keep a reserve in case enemy carriers appeared. So Nagumo looked at the maps, and by now his air searches were reaching their maximum range, and so far nothing had been found or reported. So why not use these planes for the second strike? And let's not forget that at this moment a Maverick plane from Midway had just tried to suicide crash into his bridge. Midway was clearly still a threat and as long as his airbase was operational, it posed a danger to his carriers. This is what probably prompted Nagumo's consequent decision. Midway had to be neutralized. Thus, at 0715, Nagumo went against Yamamoto's orders and ordered the rearmament of his reserve aircraft. The rearmament process began in the hangars below. Torpedoes were removed and land bombs installed. The dive bombers weren't affected by this because they were armed once they had been spotted on the flight decks. So in reality, this chaotic, fast-paced rearming process was happening only in the hangars of the 1st Carrier Division. All in all, this process was going to take about an hour and a half to complete. Then, 30 minutes into the rearmament process, at 0745, Nagumo received a report. That Tone plane, the one that had been delayed, ran across an American force. Sight what appears to be 10 enemy surface units. Nagumo was stunned. He quickly canceled and reversed the rearmament order and took stock of the situation. It will basically boil down to two options for him. Send an immediate strike right now, or send a strike after Tomonaga's planes were recovered. This is what is most commonly known as Nagumo's Dilemma. So I will ask the viewer to put themselves in Nagumo's shoes for a while to better understand his conundrum. And I'll let you know, it's not as simple as it looks. Many factors have to be considered. Keep in mind that you would have had only 15 minutes to decide on the correct course of action. There, at least in my opinion, there really isn't a correct course of action, right? Like, this is my whole thing in regards to political and military leaders historically. I, I give a, a big benefit of the doubt whenever things are happening quickly and, you know, everybody's kind of trying to keep their head above water and make the best decision they can in as quick amount of time as they can, right? And I, I'm talking about this. I've been asked what my thoughts on, um, like, the what Sweden did for World War II, right? Uh, the way that they're kind of, like, political leaders handled that. Uh, I've been asked about the U.S.'s handling of World War I um, and staying out of it until way later down the line. And, like, I may have my own opinion on how I feel like certain things could have been done better or, or whatever. But I give a huge benefit of the doubt at the time because everybody's just scrambling to make the best decision that they can and they aren't only making the decision for them. It doesn't just affect them, right? It's It affects literally everybody in the country or everybody that you're leading militarily. Like it's you're trying to do the best you can with the information you have at that moment. And it's easy with hindsight to kind of pick decisions apart and say like, no, nah, that was dumb or whatever. Um, but at least for me, I tend to give a lot of leniency for in the moment decisions that were made. Um, I think for the day, we're going to stop it right there. So this will be part one. I will finish the video and have part two out tomorrow, so be on the lookout for that. Um, as always, like, comment, subscribe. Help me keep building the channel over here. I'll put the link to the Discord down in the description below, and I'll see you all next time.